Hello and welcome. Thank you for tuning in today. My name is William Betzelberger. I am the host and founder of the Resilient Masculinity Podcast and Movement. Thank you for tuning in today and thank you for the listen. If this is your first time in to this podcast or this movement, what Resilient Masculinity was made for is a community for men by myself, by a man, to encourage, to inspire, to equip men to become the resilient, capable, strong, independent, sovereign men they are called to be, and to do so in a spirit of service to themselves, to their families, their communities, uh, their churches, their businesses, and those around them, and to bring them stability and safety in that in serving them so if that is something that you enjoy or you think that defines men then you are more than welcome to this movement and i welcome you with open arms so i'm going to start today with a very should be non-controversial statement but it's going to stir a lot of feathers it's going to ruffle a lot of feathers and that is the family is the most basic building block of society. And America's got that messed up. See, in America, and in our hyper-individualistic society, we focus on the individual. But the individual is not the most basic building block of society. The family is. And it was designed that societies should have been designed and they have been in the past designed where the family is the most basic building block of society we see that in hunter-gatherer communities we see that at the start of america and we see that at the start of any great civilization any society the family is the most basic building block not the individual when we put the individual above the family we see a breakdown of that society. Because what ultimately happens is people value themselves higher than they view their commitment to their family, and you see a breakdown of those families. So how do we fix that? How do we make a strong, capable, independent society? We focus on building the family. We focus on protecting the family. And as a Christian man, as a man of faith, I believe that God created the family as the most basic building block of society. When he created the garden, he created Adam. And then he, he gave Adam work to do. He said, tend the garden. Then he said, Adam needs a helpmate. So he created Eve. And he told them to multiply and be fruitful and do work. And in multiplying, he gave them children. And those children were to grow up, to become mature members of what would eventually become a society. And they worked and they grew and multiplied. And that's how society was formed. That's how humans were created. If that is the case, and I believe it is, and even if you don't believe that, but you believe that structure, if you still believe the nuclear family, the husband, the wife, and the children, is the most basic building block of society, then I think you can agree that we have seen a destruction of that, an erosion of that, and it's, it's taken many, many years. This wasn't an all-at-once all type thing. This has been going on for years. Uh, we see it in government programming. We see it in the, especially in lower income and racial minority communities, where the 
role of the father has now been taken by the government. And you see that through welfare, uh, through providing for the lower income families, through government programs and government assistance, not by men. The men abdicated their, their responsibility as men to provide for their families. And so the government stepped in. Now, yes, men abdicated their responsibility. Men left. That is the fault of men. The government made it worse by stepping in. And now they've incentivized that kind of behavior because it can be more financially fruitful for a family unit if the husband or the man leaves his responsibility as a provider and he lets the state do it on his behalf, it is more financially beneficial. There are times where, technically, the government could support my wife better than I can. That's not good. That's not how it's supposed to be. That's not how it's supposed to be. But it is. Am I going to abdicate my responsibility? No. But financially, it would make more sense if I abdicated my responsibility if I gave up my ma my job as a man, as a provider, for the financial benefit uh, for my family, for my wife. Now, there's a lot of things the government can't do that I can. Uh, the government is not there for emotional support or spiritual leadership or mental support, right? Mental and emotional support. I know I mentioned emotional already, but how about mental? Mental health is a big thing too. Of course, there's the physical. There's providing monetarily, but there's also physical aspects to that too. So men, it's our job. This is our responsibility is to take care of our families. And the government cannot, cannot do a better job than we do. If the government can do a better job than we can, then we are in a messed up place. Okay, that's not their job. That's not ever supposed to be their job. Sorry, that was a tangent. Back to the original idea here. Is that if men, if we want to see the, the protection of families as the most basic building block of society, we need to fight for that. And what does that look like? To me, it looks like three things. It looks like one, getting rid of pornography. Two, ending the practice of elective abortions. And three, is stopping the process of no-fault divorces. Because each of those is detrimental to the function of a family, to the survival of a family, and to the structure of a family as a whole. What do I mean by that? So first off, pornography. There's just nothing to be said that any, any good to be said about it. Okay, so I understand it's a, it's a quote unquote guy issue. Uh, no, no, it's not. It's not just a guy issue. It's not just a girl issue. It's not just people on a screen, you know, getting naked and having sexual fun. It is damaging. It is so, so pervasive in our society. And it's just, we know it's bad. We know it's not good. Yet no one talks about that. No, no, it's such an uncomfortable subject, right? No, let's be real. Okay, if in this in this movement, in this podcast, in this group, we are real. Pornography can be addicting. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Two, it's destructive, and it's deadly. It diminishes the role of a husband and a wife or a man and a woman to 
and nothing more than mere animalistic pleasure. It diminishes and dehumanizes the recipient and the giver and the recipient. In fact, in sex, there is supposed to be a give and take on both sides of the equation. The man is supposed to give himself and also receive. But the woman is to give herself and also receive. There is a, a, it's a bonding. And what pornography does is it, it's a selfish desire. It, it takes all personal connection out of it. It's just mere animalistic lust. And it's, it's a breeding ground. And I say that legitimately. It is a breeding ground for abuse. And it's highly connected. It is highly connected, men, with the human trafficking institution uh, for sex slavery. You want to know the biggest event in the United States for sex trafficking? It's the Super Bowl. Yet another reason I don't enjoy sports on a professional level. That I honestly don't think they're all that professional. But, needless to say, there's nothing good to be said about it. There's nothing good to be said about it. So, get rid of it. If it's in your life, get rid of it. Find men around you who can hold you truly accountable and say, Hey, when was the last time you saw something? You can get, a, um, you can get apps on your phone that block these things or... Or your computer or whatever you have. Whatever your chosen device is. Uh, trying to find it here. I don't have it pulled up because it's not something you can actually see very easily on my phone. But I have an app. It's an incognito blocker. And it actually runs outside of like your chosen apps. It runs outside of it. So you can't just click on the app and disable it. Like, it fully disabled incognito mode on my phone. And since it has no, um, no button, I can't disable it. Find ways to defeat yourself, men. Find ways to make it where you cannot access it. And get rid of it. There's nothing good about it. It's going to destroy your relationships. It's going to destroy your marriage. It's going to destroy your family. And it's that kind of legacy you want to bring to the table. What does he do all day? Oh, he just, just you know, watches things. It's not, it's not the legacy. That's not the legacy of men you want. It's not what you want your sons to grow into. And that's definitely not the lifestyle you want your, your you know, daughters to live. Gosh, I can't imagine can't imagine how damaging that would be to to a family to know that your sons consume that and your your daughters participate in it or vice versa even that's just damaging and there's nothing good to be said about it and it undermines the the bonding that God created for a man and a wife or a husband and a wife that is supposed to be sacred, it is supposed to be holy, it is supposed to be set apart. And it's a very, very special, very intimate relationship that gets cheapened by pornography. So get rid of it. It's 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 dead. Your second the second task if we want to build a society, if we want to regulate a society to reprioritize the family as the most basic building block of the society is that we need to get rid of elective abortions. The willful termination of a human life that is innocent. I mean, there's, again, there's nothing good to be said about it. There's, it's counterintuitive to the whole design and the whole nature of family. Family, one of the wonderful fruits of a family 
is children. One of the wonderful blessings of a family is children. The mandate for Christians, especially Christians, but the whole world in general, but also especially Christians, is to be fruitful and multiply. And we see that in the Garden of Eden. We see that um, with Noah and his family out in, after the flood with the ark. And it is a call. It is a calling. Be fruitful and multiply. That's our job. That's one of our callings. And gentlemen, that is your greatest calling, is to be fruitful and multiply and bring those kids up in a way that they are moral, just, good, righteous young men and women. And to electively, purposefully make the decision to end that life before it even begins. Well, it did begin, but before it can, can take its own breaths, before it can make any conscious decisions. That's, it's sad. It's sad because we've had the, the, we've had the unfortunate experiences of losing marriage, or losing children through miscarriages. And the idea that someone would choose to, to make that happen purposefully, it, it doesn't seem, it's not understandable to me. And I know, I know I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, you know, women's rights to choose and, and all that. And I, one, I don't buy that. I just don't buy that. That's not, no one has the right to choose to murder or to end or to terminate or however you want to say it, to put the end of an innocent human life, to end the life of an innocent human. Uh, no one, no one has the right to do that at all. What about the death penalty? The death penalty is not for innocent people. The death penalty is for evil, evil people. So you could say, what about rape and incest? Well, you're putting the punishment of the rapist, which is the death penalty. In fact, I, I fully support that. If you rape someone, yeah, yeah you should die. I'm okay with that. You're putting that death penalty on the child, and they had no, no choice in that matter. That child had no more choice in it than anyone else. They don't get, children do not get to choose how they're conceived. So I don't buy that one as an excuse. Um, and let's be frank, even if I was to give people that option, um, like even, even if that was a, let's just say, let's, let's just for the sake of argument, give that to them, still 97% at least 97% of all abortions would still happen because the majority of them are for convenience, for the lack of responsibility and the, the selfishness of people. So if we want a society that values family, that values children, that actually holds them as people, uh, people who are worthy of love and respect and honor and truth um, then we end that practice and then the third one is to end no-fault divorces and this one I actually had to do some research on um, because I understand not every state out there has no-fault divorces now what is a no-fault divorce it basically uh, means you don't have to have a reason to file for divorce and it only takes one spouse to do it. And some states and some countries, you have to have a legitimized reason to file for divorce and both parties have to sign into that divorce agreement. For example, I don't remember what states do or don't. I know Michigan is a no fault, but other than that, I really don't follow it. Um, but in some states, you are required to list the reason. For example, 
let's say a man is caught in adultery. Okay, he's sleeping with another woman even though he's married. And his wife has to file for a divorce that he is in adultery and he also has to sign that paperwork. Now, no fault would be for whatever reason or no reason. And wow, it's been so destructive. You can look at the, the trends in divorce rates after no fault divorce has been introduced. And it's just destructive. And to those who think that divorce is nothing more than a separation of a, of a husband and a wife, that's just plainly wrong. There's way too much data that shows that it's not just that. Especially once you get kids involved. If you get kids involved, oh man, they, they suffer so much from it. But at the end of the day, first of all, there's the children involved that suffer tremendously from it. Uh, you get a lot of, a lot of kids for, with divorced families who blame themselves for it. They question, why did my mom and dad, you know, why did they split? Did, was it something I did? Was it something I said? You know, they have vastly different family lives. Um, Oftentimes, you have one set of rules for one set of family and another set of rules for the other. And it's, it's, it's a tearing apart of it is the actual dis dissolving of a family. And how destructive is that? That it cheapens the wedding vows that you make. You make on your wedding day, you vow to be with each other through thick, through thin, through hell and high water, as it was, or as it were. Feast and famine, you promised before God and before each other and before witnesses that you were going to stand together. You are going to work it out. And with the exception of abuse or adultery, you know, you, and in no fault divorces, you can say they're just irreconcilable, ir, irrecon, irreconcilable differences. You don't have to specify why. So, mm, it's a Tuesday. I don't feel like it anymore. Yeah, she takes me off one, one too many times, or he said that one thing just one too many times. Wow. Wow, man. We want to value families. We stick to them. And I know that there are bad families out there. I know it. I've had the misfortune of seeing it. Not my personal family. Not my immediate family. But I've seen it. And I, I understand. But those are not supposed to be the rule. That is an exception. And not only that, they need more help than just a no fault divorce. Okay, there's a lot of therapy that needs to be involved. There needs to be a lot of counseling and, quite frankly, pastoral care uh, given to those families. But you want a society that values family? You make it hard to dissolve those families. You want, you want a society that is strong? then you build strong families. And to do so, you have to make it difficult to destroy those families. And the three most destructive trends, and at least in 2022, uh, if you want to destroy families, you flood them with pornography. You flood them with you know, a, a lack of dignity and value in terms of the value of life. Uh, through through the practice of abortion, and you you cheapen the vows that they make on their wedding day. You want to destroy families? That's how you do it. You want to make them strong? You want a strong, just, moral society? You get rid of those things. And 
that's not a popular opinion. But a uh, popular opinion right now has brought America to its knees. Popular opinion has brought death and destruction to thousands of people. Uh, millions of divorces, millions of broken families, hundreds and thousands of children affected. We're on our path to destruction. And if you want a good, strong, moral, just society, you have to readjust and you have to change. And those are the changes you have to make. Ultimately, yes, um, it is true. Uh, yeah. You can't legislate morality, so you can't legislate whether people trust in um, a god or a deity or a higher power. But you can legislate the destructive nature of abuse um, through pornography, right? Pornography leads to abuse and human trafficking. That is a that is a very, very straightforward fact, and you can look at the research on how just look at look at the research on the connections between Wayfair and human trafficking and Pornhub and human trafficking and I know that's not nice research to do but look that up and you'll see the, um, the absolute mess look at the connections and tell me that's not something that we could legislate and say, hey, um, no, it's destructive, it's abusive, it's legitimately destroying human lives on all fronts. Of course, you know, we had a, a um, you know, up prior to 1973, abortion was not a, not a major thing. So, of course, we can always go back to that. And then no-fault divorces, well, there are some states that don't allow that. So, of course, that can always be changed, too. So, at some point in time, each of those was, in fact, banned or very heavily regulated. And families were flourishing. And we actually had a strong, capable society. So, if you want a strong, capable society, you make the family strong. And ultimately, yes, it is the hope and uh, the, the desire that you build strong moral societies based off of the principles, uh, the guidance, and the instruction of God. But even if you're going to do it in a, in a uh, outside the purview of a Christian worldview, those are still verifiable strong points that you can point to and say, if you want a good society, these are what you base it off of. You still base it off the family, even in a heathenistic even in, in even in a non-christian worldview you still build strong families and to do so you got to get rid of those things so that is my plan to fix america uh it is not it is not uh initially my plan it was not original to me uh, i actually got the idea of this from a friend called named uh josh josh bishop he wrote that post, I just had to expand on it. I had to share my thoughts on it and express some, some flesh it out a little more. So gentlemen, if you want to build a strong family, if you want to build a strong society, um, personal, personally, you get rid of pornography, you embrace the value of children, and you, you call them blessings, and you value them as human lives, and you maintain your word as a man, and your, your vow as a husband. And as a society, we push to eliminate the threats. Uh, we, we don't just vote to eliminate. No, we attack and we eliminate the threats to family, and we eliminate and attack threats to the structure of society as a whole. We can't just mean play nice anymore. Uh, this is a war. This is war on families. And if we're going to fight, we're going to fight and we're going to win. So 
don't just play nice. Don't just bring it to, to your family. Bring the fight to the forces that are destroying. And at the end of the day, uh, just remember that there is victory. There will be victory. So thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like it, share it, uh, subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you in the next one. Uh, Thank you guys. And until next time, take action and become the capable men you are called to be.